Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. The holidays are a season of giving, but there is something about spending too much and perhaps being too generous that busts your budget. We're gonna talk today about how we can stay within our budget while still spreading holiday cheer. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm your host, Colleen Roylands. Stick with us and we're gonna talk tips and tricks for keeping your holiday budget sane. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us today is Bob Lopp. Bob is uh, the financial advisor for Mountain Pacific Quality Health and has a very deep financial background. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, tips and tricks so that we don't overspend during the holidays. Let's start with gifts. Gifts are huge and probably take up the bulk of our budget. How can we keep our shopping under control? Well, it's gonna sound like no fun at all, but the real answer is to start out with a budget and figure out how many people you have that you need to shop for. Uh, take that list and narrow it down to the folks that you actually really need to shop for, and then figure out what you think your overall amount that you can spend and divide it out between those, realizing that you're not gonna have the exact same dollar amount for each one of your three daughters. Oh, you have three daughters that you have to spend for. Well, that's a lot of gift giving right there. That's absolutely right. And uh, they are definitely looking at what the other one got. So finding balance is a trick. Finding balance is a trick. And in fact, let's just jump to that real quick. When you have family and friends that are in different financial situations, how do you have those conversations about the giving and receiving so that people don't feel like they're not measuring up? Yeah, Colleen, I think that's a really important thing to kind of establish a family culture or culture with your friends uh, around. It's not the dollar value of the gift, but it's how imp important and meaningful it is uh, to the individual person and that the thought that you put that went into the into the gift. So it might be that you agree to do a task for them or you're going to do uh, something that they would prefer not to do and, and you're willing to take that on or find a different solution. So I think being creative is a huge piece of the equation. And then I think for parents and grandparents in particular is getting away from the idea that it's got to be equal dollar amounts. It should be equal utility amounts. So which is each kid or each relative going to get in terms of personal value, not how much did I spend on it. Yeah, I think that's a really important point as well. So you mentioned budgeting. Uh, your budget has to include the gifts, and then what about other expenses that you're going to run into during the holidays? Decorations, food, maybe even travel. Well, I think that's a, I think those are a great list of things. So we're automatically always going to spend more than what we were sort of planning, unless you're my grandmother who was going to spend exactly to the penny <laughs> what was the amount that she had budgeted. Um, so if you think about the broad categories of those things and you kind of divide them up and say, well, we're going to spend more on food because we're going to have extra meals, so my food budget is going to be greater. And, and to think in advance about how you might plan those things out, do I need to have five turkeys or is two turkeys going to work over? you know, Christmas to New Year's. And then on the stuff like decorations, um, there's kind of a, a balance between the folks that have, uh, like at my house, we have decorations for every holiday going back to like 1964. Uh, so we could reuse things. We don't have to add that many new things. My three daughters, again, to go to that example, are beginning to build their own Christmas stuff, for example, at their house or their own Halloween stuff. So it's really about watching through the year and adding things to your collection, even though I know that doesn't fit in the Marie Kondo, you know, we should have <laughs> less things. I think it depends on how big your house is and how much space you have to store. Well, you can keep them all as long as they give you joy. I am. That's what Marie says. I'm with you. Her definition of joy and my definition of joy might be different. We have enough Halloween costumes that we could uh, outfit the whole neighborhood on uh, October 30th. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, so let's talk about impulse buying and match that up with a, a, tip, a tip that some people say really, really works, and that is that you pay with cash because then you physically know exactly what you're spending. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think, that I think there's a couple of thoughts there, Colleen, and that's absolutely right. So there's this thing in economics, not to get boring about it, but it's called pocket accounting. So if you put money in one pocket and you have your rent money and your house payment and your bills that you have to pay on a monthly basis on another and only spend the money out of your fund pocket, then that's a way to think about it. And actually, famous economists create separate accounts so that it's their their fun account and then where the rest of their budget goes. Um, on the issue of how to stay in a budget, and everybody, uh, again, with the exception of my grandmother, claims that they have a budget. And very few people actually stay on that every, every month, and it's unreasonable to expect that's the case. But if you make a list of things on your phone, and there's lots of free apps that you can use now, so you could put your grocery list on there, and you can share it with your family, and everyone could put the items on that you want to have to buy to take home, and you check them off the list so you're not getting into that impulse buy at the checkout counter. Another great thing you can do with your phone and these, or, uh, and these online lists is that you can create lists for gifts as an example. So you might have an idea in February for something you want to give for the following Thanksgiving to your you know, great Aunt Bertha, and you put it there, and then you're not thinking at the last second, oh, I've got to go find it. And also during the year when that item might be on sale, then you can purchase it and save money. So using the tools that we have in front of us is really different than what it was, again, in and the olden days when I was growing up. <laughs> All right, so you mentioned uh, getting things throughout the year, and that, that's one of the questions that I had for you. Uh, the benefit of shopping throughout the year versus doing it all at once. And uh, for those folks who maybe are on a rest restricted income or a fixed budget, maybe they're retired, I would think that's a really good way for them to go and do this and still stay in their budget. It is an awesome uh, way to approach it. And, uh, and I'll give you a simple example. Uh, if we talk about birthday cards and holiday cards that you know cost you whatever, five, six bucks at the grocery store at the last minute if you're a dad and you're running to get them. Um, my mother was religious about going in the day after the holiday and buying the next year's Christmas cards and so any event could come up during the year whether it was a Thanksgiving an anniversary a kid's birthday a neighbor's dogs you know <laughs> came home holiday she had a card that she could pull out of the drawer that she definitely played 10% of what the retail cost if she bought it the day before the holiday so it's a great idea that is a brilliant idea all right we're gonna take just a, a quick break thank you so much for all of those tips and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about credit cards and some of the common mistakes or benefits of using credit cards for your holiday shopping. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. We are going to talk a little bit about credit cards, the pros and cons, and we still have Bob Lopp with us to tell us more. So, Bob. Uh, do I want one credit card and put everything on one credit card? Do I want multiple credit cards? Spread it all out? What's your advice? I wish that there was an easy answer to this. And so there's a bunch of factors that you have to consider in a bunch of different circumstances. So if, on the one hand, it's really only necessary to have one credit card and, and there's some sense and argument for that so that you can really see all your purchases at one location and hopefully you're uh, being careful about shopping for the lowest interest credit card payment that you could have. There's an argument to have at least two, so in case one is lost and in an emergency, you'd have a second one that you might have stashed away so that you could pull it out of the cookie jar or wherever you had it in case an emergency came up. And it's a great idea to have enough uh, uh, credit or money stored on that so that you could take care of an emergency, like if you had to travel out of town for a sudden you know, family illness or something along that path. It's the most important part is that you're paying off your balances all the time and that you're developing better credit as you go. So if you decided, as an example, let's say that someone got divorced uh, and their ex-husband had left them with bad credit and they needed to reestablish it, as an example, um, you might want to have two or three cards that you had low balances or low available credit to start with and you paid them off religiously so that you could drive up what your uh, credit reporting is. And, but again, you want to make sure that you're using your credit cards for what they're really intended for, which is short-term purchases that you're going to pay off at the end of the month. If you're going to make bigger purchases, we want to do that using probably your debit card uh, for some of those things and making sure that you already had the cash instead of borrowing against your future and hoping to pay it back later. Okay, so let's follow up on that whole paying it back part, because that's always a nightmare. <laughs> um, any organizational tips to keep yourself 
on task and pay those cards off when they're due or maybe even a little bit early so you don't miss any payments? Yeah, um, actually, Colleen, that's a great question. So one of the things, again, to use technology that we have now is that you could set up your monthly reminder on your phone to say, I need to make my credit card payment or your student loan payment, whatever it happens to be on a given date. Um, a lot of times your credit card company also will allow you to shift your payment dates. So you could either decide that you're going to have all my payments due on the 25th of the month, or I maybe want to have some of them on the beginning of the month and some at the end of the month if I'm you know, worrying about when my paychecks come in. And another issue that's really important for people, you talked about fixed income before. Well, essentially everybody lives on fixed income whether they know it or not. The question is how much variable income that they have. So if they have a sales commission job or they get yearly bonuses or those kinds of things. Um, and again, you want to account for that in your credit card decisions and what you keep as balances and keeping you want higher levels of credit available and then try not to use it if you can avoid it at all possible and pay your bill off on time. Okay, that is great. Now, getting a credit card, you talked about low interest, you want low interest rate, um, and then they come up with all kinds of things that lure you in, you know, <laughs> bonus points and don't pay any interest for six months. What do you have to be careful of there? So the first question to ask is, well, what are they getting out of the deal that they're offering me? So if I get a bunch of miles and I never fly anywhere, well, then that's, you know, I've wasted whatever the benefit of that was going to be. If it's a zero interest, especially if you talk about uh, like the smart, the department store credit cards on that thing. What they really want you to do is to get in the habit and you were going to go and spend $100 to buy a new pair of pants and a, and a shirt for work. And while you're there, you see that uh, uh, belts are on sale for 30% off. And that's another $50 that you weren't intending on spending when you win it. So there's some upside. If you're aware of what you think the upside is for the people that are offering you credit, then you can do a better job of managing where and what you want want to get. Amazon is an example. If you think of Amazon Prime as being essentially a credit card that you're paying um, uh, for the free uh, shipping to your house for the 120 bucks a year, or whatever it is, they get something out of the transaction. Think about what that is that they get. And if that's a fair value to you, then God bless, that's great. But if not, don't have stuff that you're not using. Okay. So uh, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people when they're using their credit cards. You talked about you want to pay off your bills all the time, uh, keep your balance low. What else? Um, I think one thing that we, uh, that we have, and I certainly experienced, especially when I was younger, that if you have an available credit amount, you think, oh, I'm gonna get paid next Tuesday for this, and I can, I can buy, uh, I can, uh, you know, buy presents or go out and have dinner and splurge a little bit now, and I'll make up for it later. Later comes faster than you think it's gonna come, and you still are gonna have to pay that, and you're essentially paying for the privilege of not having been responsible budgeting your money. If you budget your money well, and then you spend out of your, your savings account, and then you hold Hold on to your savings account like it's uh, uh, the most treasured piece of jewelry you've ever been given in your life. Then you're going to have a uh, you're going to have an ability to save. My wife is an example. Uh, I'm pretty sure if she went to open her savings account, like the savings book would creak as it opened because <laughs> she's a heck of a saver because that's how she treats her money. That's really that's really good, really good advice. All right, budgeting. Uh, let's say you, you, know, you can't quite afford what you want to afford on your budget, and maybe you want to look at a part-time job during the holidays. You know, what are the pros and cons there other than it's a stressful time and now you're adding more stress? Well, Colleen, I think that's a really good point that uh, this balance between the things that we want and need or think we want and need versus what you're willing to trade your time for and to do. Would you ra is it a bigger gift to give to your family to be home and, and to eat cookies that you've baked that cost a total of you know seven dollars and you got an hour to spend together, or would you rather drop them off at the babysitter and go take go take a job and and work during the Christmas holidays? And there's certainly an argument for both, and that one of the arguments is is, well, this is when work is abundant and I can rake in the hours and we could celebrate later by going on picnics in the spring. That's great. You just have to be aware that that's the decision you're making. And then the other thing I think we, we neglect sometimes is that 
uh, uh, the impacts on our health. So it's one thing to go to one job for eight or 10 hours a day, and then you add another six or seven hours a day for a part-time job, and you come back, you just don't have any time to recharge, and like I say, you, uh, with your family or the other activities that you might wanna be involved with, which are really important for our long-term health. So on a temporary basis, certainly understandable. If there's an emergency and people need to uh, build up cash, let's say, or have an income so that they can take care of that, but let's be I'm really careful about doing it for a, uh, so you can afford to buy toys that your kids are going to forget about in the back of the closet in two weeks. That's a really good point. Thank you. We're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have some more tips and tricks for how you can stay financially healthy during the holiday season. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's continue our financial advice with Bob. Bob, if we step back and we take a look at the bigger picture and some of the trends, we've got inflation at a 40 year high. How do you budget around things like that? Um, that is a great question and there are a whole bunch of people on Wall Street and in Congress and in the White House that would love to be able to have an answer for that. It's, it's uh, complicated, but we talk about it in our day-to-day -day lives where that goes. You really are going to have increased expenses and almost never is your uh, increase in, in wage earning going to keep up with what your increase in expenses are. So it really is, uh, unfortunately, you have to dial back um, where, you're, where you're spending money and making sure that they really are sort of essential things. Um, you know, it's the hunting season now, so maybe you decide that I really don't need to drive 50 miles a day looking for deer. Maybe I can figure out how to do more hiking out of my backyard and, and you know, those kinds of things. Um, but I do believe that in the long term, if you look over the history of America, these have been relatively temporary things. So if you just stick to your knitting and your budgeting again and making sure that you're saving uh, on a consistent basis, that's the important thing. And one last thought on that, Colleen, which is to say, if we talk about budgets like they're magic, but really what I want at the end of the day, this will sound dumb, but am I bringing in more money than is actually going out? And am I building savings over time so that I have that security and protection? Because nobody can tell you when inflation is gonna flip. Nobody can tell you what's gonna go on in the economy long term. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be on TV shows telling people how to invest. Um, and with that being the case, as long as I've got positive cash flow, you can't go out of business, as the expression says, as long as you've got positive cash coming, and we need to do that in our personal lives. And, you know, I want to just touch back a little bit. You talked about uh, when people are on a fixed income and, you know, the inflation can put you there, right? And so you talked about, well, maybe you do a task for someone instead of a gift. And now you just talked about hunting, which made me think maybe you do an experience instead of a gift, or maybe you do some handmade I, gifts. I, I think that's fantastic. And, and I honestly think that, A, if that's... Uh, we know from a psychological perspective that experiences are actually much higher in the list of what drives human happiness and human satisfaction. So uh, being able to spend those times with the ones that we love and our friends and the folks around us. We also know from all the evidence that uh, uh, participating in something that's bigger than yourself, so whether it's church activities or a volunteer activity or you're doing coaching of kids, those are things that uh, drive tremendous meaning for us as human beings and they don't cost much if anything, if you go down that path. And then on the craft side of the thing, we know, again, to go to the psychology of it, that when people get in flow, when you're involved in an activity that you really enjoy and lose track of time, like making cookies or doing uh, sewing or uh, doing woodworking in the garage, that not only are you creating something that's an, uh, an emblem of your love for somebody else, and that makes us feel good, but we get to get all that flow advantage while we're doing the activity. So you're getting really two or three or four for one for each hour that you spend. That's awesome, I really like that. All right, so if we're talking about budgets again, uh, do I need some really expensive fancy software or how do I, how do, I do this on the, on the lowdown, on the cheap? 
Uh, absolutely not. You can do it. <laughs> I'll go back to my grandmother, which uh, when when she passed and we opened up, she had uh, boxes of little ledgers that went back to like 1917 with everything, including what time she changed the oil in the, in the Buick and uh, how much she spent on, you know, orange spice tea in a given week. Um, so you could do it on paper. That's fine. But not everybody has to be sort of... Uh, over the top on what they do. There are a ton of free apps that you have that will help you do budgeting easily on your phone. You can use things like Excel. It's really not very complicated to do it. And honestly, all you need to do is really track, um, here's what my income is, and I know that I'm gonna get on every month. Here's my major expenses that I have, like my house payment and what I have to pay for my car payment and those kinds of things. And then here's my variable expense. And again, you don't need to balance that to the penny. If you say I spend roughly $40 a month on buying coffee at Starbucks, you know how many times a week you go, you know what your order is. So you just kind of plug that in. And if you get to a ballpark number that tells you, as I like to say, the temperature of the day, not which particular degree of Fahrenheit and Celsius translates into it, that'll be fine for understanding where your money goes. And you can take that $40 that you're spending on Starbucks and buy a gift instead. Okay, that's all I'm <laughs> saying about go. that one. Okay, what about uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday? Uh, are they really the best deals? Are they really good deals? So that's an excellent question that might be, my, my answer might be unpopular in my own household. But uh, I think that people get tremendous deals and I understand they're discounted, but a lot of times you gotta remember that retailers are gonna mark that up because they know what that discounted price is gonna be and they're trying to drive all the volume of traffic in there. So again, I would recommend if there are specific things that you have your eye on and you thought you could buy it for $500 and now it's gonna be on sale for $200 and you've waited all year to go uh, buy whatever that item is, and you're willing to, you know, put on a, a baseball helmet and, and wear a catcher's, <laughs> you know, mask to fight through the crowd. Good luck and God bless you. On the other hand, if you wait a little bit after that, you're still going to find those items on sale at places because they don't sell everything out in that period of time. So I think there's a balance of that. And then uh, another area that we think about, which is that there's going to be lots of people who buy stuff on Black Friday that three months later is going to show up on Craigslist because they realize that they didn't need to double compound bow with, you know, like headgear. So you want to think about that as well when you're looking for purchases. That's really helpful. Uh, we are out of time for today, but Bob, that was great. I really enjoyed learning all those tips and tricks that you have. Well, thanks and for- It's a lot to think about. Thanks for inviting me and how much fun to talk to you, Colleen. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for watching. We hope you'll join us again next week. And until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Take care. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.